Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on complex variables. In this video we're going to prove Rouché's theorem and then use Rouché's theorem to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. Rouché's theorem follows quite neatly from the argument principle which we discussed in the previous video. The statement of Rouché's theorem goes something like this. Suppose C is a simple closed contour on the complex plane. Suppose also that I have two complex functions f and g that are both analytic inside C and on C, so f and g don't have any poles. In addition, suppose that the magnitude or modulus of f is greater than the magnitude or modulus of g at each point on the curve C. If these conditions hold, then f of z and f of z plus g of z have the same number of zeros, counting multiplicities, inside the closed contour C. We'll begin the proof by considering the modulus of g of z on the closed contour C. Because of the definition of the modulus of the complex number, the modulus of g of z must be greater than or equal to zero. It's a magnitude, it obviously can't be negative. Now because the modulus of f of z is greater than the modulus of g of z on the curve C according to this statement in the theorem, we can add this additional inequality to the front of this expression. The implication of this inequality is that the modulus of f of z is greater than zero on the curve C, which means that f of z is non-zero on the curve C. It has no zeros. If it did have zeros, then its modulus would not be positive everywhere on the curve C, because the modulus of a zero would be zero. In addition, since the modulus of f of z is positive and greater than the modulus of g of z, we can move this modulus of g of z to the left hand side of this inequality and say that the modulus of f of z minus the modulus of g of z is greater than zero. Now there's a theorem in complex analysis that the modulus of the sum of two complex numbers is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the difference of their moduli. If we apply this theorem to f and g, here's what we'll get. Since the modulus of the sum of f and g is now greater than zero according to this inequality, we can also say that the function f plus g also has no zeros on c, using the same logic we use for the function f alone. Now that we've established that f of z and f of z plus g of z have no zeros on the contour c, then combined with the fact that f and g are analytic inside and on C, as well as the fact that C is a simple closed contour, we've satisfied all the prerequisites for the argument principle. This means that we can apply the argument principle to f and f plus g. If we apply it to f, then we'll get zf minus pf equals 1 over 2 pi times the change in the argument of f of z as we traverse the curve C. If we apply it to f of z plus g of z, we'll get zfg minus pfg equals 1 over 2 pi times the change in the argument of f plus g over the curve c. I mentioned earlier in the statement of Rouché's theorem that f and g are both analytic inside c, which means that they have no poles inside c. As a result, these p's are zeros and I can cancel them from these two equations. F has no poles, G has no poles, so F plus G obviously will not have any poles. Let's take the change in the argument of F plus G and analyze it over on the side. We can start by factorizing the F within the argument expression. Now the argument of the product of F of Z and 1 plus G of Z over F of Z is just the sum of their individual arguments. Now let me illustrate why this is the case on the side. Let's say I had a complex number z1 with an argument theta1, and another complex number z2 with an argument theta2. Now if I multiply z1 and z2, their argument will consist of theta1 plus theta2 because of the property of powers that powers with the same base that multiply are added together in the exponent. This property that the argument of z1 times z2 is the argument of z1 plus the argument of z2 is what allows us to split up the functions in the argument up here. Let's take this equation and multiply it by 1 over 2 pi. If we do that, here's what we'll get. Now the expression on the left is just equal to zfg, and the first expression on the right is just equal to zf according to the argument principle we applied above. All that's left is dealing with the winding number of 1 plus g of z over f of z. And I'm going to denote this function by h of z. We already know that on the contour c, the modulus of g of z is less than the modulus of f of z from the original assumptions of the theorem. 
This means that if I take the modulus of g of z over f of z, I'll end up with an answer less than one. And since the modulus of g of z over f of z, which is the same as the modulus of the ratio of g of z and f of z, since this modulus is less than one, it follows from the definition of h of z that the modulus of h of z minus one is also less than one. So if I were to draw the contour representing w equals h of z in the complex plane, then that contour would be centered at w equals one. And because the modulus of all the complex numbers on that contour is less than one, the contour representing h of z will never encircle the origin because it will never deviate a distance greater than one from the center at w equals one. And since this contour will never encircle the origin, its winding number up here must be zero. Remember, if a contour does not encircle the origin, its winding number is zero. That's a property of winding numbers. And if we apply this, we'll leave with the following expression relating the zeros of f inside c to the zeros of f plus g inside c. That the zeros of f plus g, counting multiplicities inside c, equals the zeros of f inside c. And this is what we needed to prove with Rouchet's theorem, that f and f plus g have the same number of zeros inside the contour c, counting multiplicities. So this final statement should complete our proof. Let's solve an example problem involving Rouchet's theorem. And this is a pretty involved example because it involves using Rouchet's theorem to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. We'll start off this example by first stating the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that if I have a polynomial P of Z of degree N with complex coefficients, then that polynomial has N complex roots or N complex zeros counting the multiplicities. Note that N here is a positive integer. To prove this theorem, we'll start by setting f of z to the last term of this polynomial and g of z to every other term before it. We'll let our simple closed contour c be a circle with a very large radius r. On this circle, the modulus of the function f of z is just the modulus of a n times capital R to the power n. Now the number of zeros of f of z inside this contour c is n, counting multiplicity of course, because since f of z is a n times z to the n, f of z has one zero at z equals zero, but this zero it has a multiplicity of n because z is raised to the power n. Therefore the number of zeros of f of z inside the contour c is just n, taking multiplicity into account. Let's now look at the modulus of g of z on the contour c. The magnitude of g of z is the modulus of the sum of all these terms. One of the properties of the modulus is that the modulus of the sum of a bunch of complex numbers must be less than or equal to the sum of the individual moduli. We can split up these individual moduli into the separate moduli products. Then we can plug in the fact that on the contour C, the modulus of Z is R. When we do that, here's what we'll get for the modulus of G of Z. Let's perform another special operation. Let's multiply each of these individual terms on the right by r raised to some power, such that each term now multiplies r to the n minus one. So for instance, this a naught term, I'm gonna multiply by r to the n minus one. The a one term, I'm gonna multiply by r to the n minus two, and so on. Now if we do that, so that each term now multiplies r to the n minus one, we'll find that our new right-hand side is now even greater than the older right-hand side because r, again, is much, much greater than one. So as a result, this inequality will still hold. What we'll do now is divide this inequality by the modulus of f of z on both sides. The modulus of f of z is positive, so that won't change the sign of our inequality at all. So we can just divide by the modulus of f of z without changing anything. But we already know that the modulus of f of z is the modulus of a n times r to the n. So we can make the substitution, but we'll only do it on the right hand side of this inequality. We can then cancel the r's in the numerator and denominator on the right, and here's what we'll end up with. Now, if r were large enough that it were greater than this expression, the sum of the magnitudes of the lower order coefficients divided by a n, then this term on the right hand side of the inequality would obviously be less than one. So as a result, by the transitive property, the ratio of the moduli of g of z and f of z would be less than one, which therefore means that the modulus of g of z on the contour c would be less than the modulus of f of z on the contour c. At this point, we're ready to apply Rouchet's theorem. 
The first condition is obviously satisfied. C is just a very large circle, so it's a simple closed contour. The second condition of Rouchet's theorem is also satisfied because f and g are just simple polynomials, so therefore they must be analytic inside and on C. They don't have any poles. And the third condition is what we just proved, that the modulus of f is greater than the modulus of g on the contour C. Because all these conditions are satisfied, we can apply Rouchet's theorem and say that the function f of z has the same number of zeros as the function f of z plus g of z, which is just the whole polynomial p of z. But how many zeros does f of z have? Well, we showed that a couple of minutes ago. f of z has n zeros inside c, counting multiplicity. As a result, the polynomial p of z also has n zeros inside z, counting multiplicity. And this proves the fundamental theorem of algebra, that a polynomial of degree n with complex coefficients has n roots in the complex plane, counting multiplicities. Of course, our proof is contingent on the fact that we choose a large enough contour C with a large enough radius R that this condition is satisfied. However, this shouldn't be a problem. The fundamental theorem of algebra doesn't restrict us to a particular region in the complex plane when it comes to the roots. Pretty much the entirety of the complex plane is fair game, which is why we can be very liberal in how large we want our contour C to be. Anyway, that should do it for the video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.